Our next speaker is also talking about uh, green streets and parks, and uh, that we're going to be uh, brought with uh, Linda Valchek from uh, PHS, who's, gonna, who's a landscape architect, has been working with us, and uh, has a background in horticultural, historic preservation, and design for residential, institutional, and urban projects, both in the US and in Europe. And she's a, a Master of Landscape Architect from the University of Georgia. Uh, School of Engi Environmental Design and a Bachelor of Horticulture from the University of Maryland. So, Linda? Okay. Hi, everyone. As Howard said, I'm, I'm a landscape architect with Philadelphia Green. Oops. And I've had the privilege in recent years of working on some exciting projects through our environmental initiatives uh, program in partnership with the Water Department. Philadelphia Green has a long history of working with community park groups and partnering with city agencies to improve and revitalize parks. We consider these green spaces and managing stormwater as a logical match. However, in order for a stormwater project to be fully embraced by the neighbors and park users, it must be conceived as an asset to the park, adding to the user experience. When stormwater projects can be integrated with park improvements, most are all for it. Shown in the upper right is the installation of an infiltration bed fed by an adjacent parking lot. The bed is located under a new basketball court at Clark Park in West Philadelphia, which replaced the dilapidated court. Shown in the center of the slide are new coarse concrete sidewalks and tree trenches, which Glenn showed earlier, at Waterview Recreation Center that greatly improve the entrance to this facility. While Waterview and Clark Park are examples of primarily hardscape and, and subsurface solutions, today I'm going to describe a project that uses grading and landscape as the primary strategy for surface stormwater management. Both projects demonstrate the goal of managing street runoff while providing an amenity to their park. The two site, oh, the one site is Clarkton Park. <laughs> that was completed about a year ago. So these are two, the original two project sites shown in relation to the historic streams of Philadelphia. You all are probably familiar with this map. Um, Cliveden, Park, Cliveden Park is in the East Mount Airy section of the city and sits within the Tuconi Frankfurt watershed. Here we see those sites in relation to the current condition with many of the historic streams put into pipes. This is particularly evident in the TTF. So we'll begin with Cliveden Park. North is generally to the upper right and the uh, right corner in this image. Cliveden is a city park managed by the Department of Recreation. The park is one block in size, about six acres, surrounded by sidewalk streets in a fairly dense residential neighborhood of row homes, twin homes, and apartment buildings. The park is used for active and passive recreation, community events, a farmer's market, and there's a children's playground near the center of the park. An historic stone house fronts on Musgrave Street on the south side. This land is only a few blocks away from where the Battle of Germantown was fought and where the historic Chu estate known as Cliveden is located. The park is quite pastoral, characterized by gently curved paths, open lawn, and many large mature canopy trees. The change in grade across the site is significant, 34 feet from the highest corner at Musgrave, feet, Musgrave and Cliveden Streets to the low point near the corner of Chu and Johnson. The topography is evidence of a stream that once flowed through the site. In the early 20th century, the stream was encapsulated in a combined sewer in adjacent streets. The historic stream channel is now represented by a broad swale which leads to a storm inlet at the site's low point. The inlet connects to the combined sewer in Johnson Street. The swale is crossed at one point by a pedestrian path, and before the most recent improvements were made, water in the swale passed through a culvert under the path. The culvert was inundated, however, and often water would back up on the high side of the path or flood the path area when the culvert's capacity was exceeded. The park's low point was often damp, but was accepted by the park friends group who had transformed it into a rain garden, planting it with wet tolerant plants a few years before. Prior to improvements, all street runoff was captured in inlets at the major intersections um, indicated by the blue dots. Here you see how the path crosses the swale and water on the high side of the culvert. The first image shows water mo moving from the low side of the culvert to the rain garden. The inlet at the low point is shown in the center image and the planted rain garden is on the far right.
In 2004, the Friends of Cliveden Park, along with PHS and the Department of Recreation, completed a master planning process, which among other things, identified the low area of the park as needing improvement. It was desired that it retain more water and that it be planted as a rain garden, which I mentioned the group subsequently did. A few years later, the Water Department was actively looking for sites in the TTF watershed to implement sustainable stormwater practices, and PHS, who was partnering with the Water Department by this time on green infrastructure projects, proposed Cliveden Park for consideration given the master plan recommendation for the rain garden. PHS and PWD met with the group to explain our interests and the likelihood that enhancing the rain garden would make sense as an investment for PWD if street runoff were recruited into the system. The Friends Group agreed to give it a try. But most important, all parties were committed to making this project an attractive and educational amenity for the park. Initial concepts were explored between PHS and PWD. We then brought Duffield Associates on board as our consulting engineers. Funding was committed by multiple sources, the Water Department with money from DEP, Bank of America selected Cliveden Park as the recipient of a modest grant for improvements, and PHS directed discretionary funds for park improvements to the project, which we had through the city's former Neighborhood Transformation Initiative. Although the design was not an intense community design process, the Friends Group was kept informed and given opportunities for comments and to raise concerns, as was the Department of Recreation. As we began to discuss the concept of bringing street runoff into the park, it became clear, given the topography, that terracing would be necessary. Various retaining options were considered, including fairly expensive masonry walls and less expensive gabion baskets. A compromise was found in facing gabion baskets with dry laid stone. I had worked on a project about 10 years ago at the office of Rodney Robinson Landscape Architects in Wilmington, where we implemented this technique to much success in Brandywine Park. The walls shown here are large weep walls as part of a terraced linear swale system to control runoff in a formerly seriously eroded section of the park. These walls became our inspiration for the Cliveden project, which we modified to meet the needs of our site. Our design focused on the north end, which is the low end of the site, to maximize capture. The key elements of the plan are the new street inlets on Cliveden and Johnson Streets, three terraced infiltration basins on the Cliveden side of the park, shown as the light green ovals on the plan, raising the existing park inlet to act as the outlet structure for the system, an improved pedestrian swale crossing to accommodate larger flows, and planting, indicated by the purple crescent shapes and small dark green circles on the plan. Four street drainage areas, totaling approximately 1.2 acres, are managed by the new inlets. The entire six acres of the park are also accounted for. PWD directed Duffield to design for the three-month, 24-hour storm with the goals of infiltration, limited detention, and peak flow reduction. With this in mind, Duffield sized the basins, all pipes, and related infrastructure. The four new street inlets are located just upslope from the existing inlets on Johnson and Cliveden Streets at Chew Avenue. Each set of inlets is connected via a pipe across the street. A challenge was found in setting the elevations of the inlets and pipes so as to avoid the many utilities within the cartway. On Johnson Street, the new catch basins drop 10 feet below street grade, resulting in a pipe entering the park at an elevation only slightly above the rain garden, and that's on the bottom of the screen. On Cliveden Street, the catch basins drop 9 feet below street, street grade to avoid utilities, but on this side of the park, there's significantly more grade to work with. As this site section illustrates, the pipe could enter the park higher up the slope, which is where the terracing became necessary. Three infiltration basins were gently graded into the slope. Each basin is approximately 550 square feet in area and is designed to detain and infiltrate approximately six inches of water. Outflow from each infiltration basin is controlled by a weir through the retaining wall. The walls are meant to weep as necessary to relieve saturation. In the detail section, you can see the gabion core with a stone facing and cap. Since vandalism was a consideration, the stones were loosely mortared here and there to add additional security. These walls at a length of about, of about 15 feet are about half the length of the Brandywine Park walls and at three feet high are at least a foot shorter. They're faced with Wissahick and Schist and capped with a complementary local stone typically used for stair treads. The energy dissipators at their base are made from a local flagstone neatly set on end in a pattern perpendicular to the direction of flow. This was preferred over a typical riprap application. As a value engineering measure, the final version of the pedestrian bridge was downsized, simplified, and constructed from two precast concrete headwalls connected by an elliptical pipe below the walk. 
The precast pieces were faced in stone and a metal handrail was added. The culvert opening was increased from the previous 12 inches to 30 inches. So this design is about the water, the topography, and the materials. As I mentioned, Wissahick and Schist was used as the primary wall material, which, by the way, they were digging up tons of during the excavation. Plants were selected that are appropriate to the woodland setting and are used strategically to visually tie the structures into the landscape. Extensive areas of grass blend the project into the rest of the park. The basins were seeded with a detention basin mix. Now to the construction. After a thorough bid process, the project was started in the summer of 2007. Extensive construction fence was ne necessary to help protect the existing trees. The project required that five trees be removed due to grading. In the lower left image, you see the orange arc spray painted on the ground, indicating the location of one of the retaining walls, excavation for the walls, and placement of the gabion baskets. Each wall core is made up of three three by three by six gabions filled with stone. The center gabion is lowered a bit to accommodate for the weir. Here you can see the schist veneer starting to be laid, as well as the beginnings of the energy dissipator. The Cliveden Street inlets are shown on the top images during demolition of the paving and then after installation. The Johnson Street catch basin, basins are shown below. The latter is in the inlet on the, street, on the side of the street opposite the park. Within the trench, some utilities are visible, and the park is seen beyond the second inlet. Here the contractor is raising the existing park inlet to serve as the outlet control structure, and on the right, the pipe entering the park from, Johnson, from the Johnson Street catch basin. The flared end section was a cost-cutting measure since the handsome stone head wall that was proposed proved too expensive. The energy dissipators at the inlets to the park are the same that are at the weir wall, the same that are the ones at the weir walls. The bridge was being constructed um, at the same time. Getting these head walls into place was a bit difficult due to their weight and location in the middle of the park. The bridge schist veneer was mortared to the head wall and the capstones were placed on the weir walls. By the fall, the shrubs and trees were planted and the grass was beginning to grow. The street inlets would not be opened, however, until the basins were stabilized with sufficient vegetative growth. By the spring of 2008, the grass had grown enough to open the inlets. The system works well, handling the influx of water through the swale, the basins, and into the rain garden. Prior to construction, perk tests yielded infiltration rates of approximately two inches per hour. No standing water is in the system the day after heavy rain. The ribbon was cut during a festive and appropriately wet ceremony. In the end, the community is very excited about and proud of the improvements and beautification of their park. Large garden work days are held at least two times per year, and necessary plant maintenance for the first year was accomplished through contracted services. Unfortunately, vandalism has taken its toll on some of the plants, and a bit of reconfiguring has been done to lessen the impacts and opportunities for vandalism. However, attentive ongoing maintenance is one of the biggest challenges of this project and frankly any vegetated system. The requirements and goals of the project were realized from a technical, social, and aesthetic standpoint. I invite you to visit Cliveden and see for yourself.